Good morning. A warm welcome, everybody. If you could find a space and we can carry on our chats at the end or in that lovely bit in the middle where you go and speak to someone who you don't know just yet. So my name is Michelle, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Life Church Bath this morning. Hello. <laughs> you guys look so joyful and lovely. You do. So we're going to just, I say just, it's not a just, we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus. Because that's why you came this morning, isn't it? You didn't came, come to see me or hear me say something for a minute at the beginning, that's for sure. We came this morning to fix our eyes on Jesus. So shall we stand if you can stand? That would be great. So Father, we just come before your throne of grace. We come before your throne of mercy this morning. We stand in the presence of your might and your power, your love. We stand in the presence of the weight, the weight of your glory. Father, we ask for that weight to be present with us this morning. So everything in our week, anything we've walked in here with, we just want to surrender it now, don't we? All echoes of our week that trouble us, that are not of you, God, they fall now in the name of Jesus. Everything. It says in Philippians, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So anything in our week, in our lives, that's not of him. We just declare this morning, it will bow the knee to Jesus right now. So we even call that thing to mind. It could be big. It could be a sickness. It could be an issue at work, a relationship problem. It could be my kids are not sleeping at night and I'm wrecked. We declare that as we worship, as we lift him high where he deserves to be, that everything will bow the knee to him because that is the word of God and therefore that is the truth. And we live from that reality, right? So let's just fix our eyes on him. He says in Hebrews, he is the heir of all things and through him he made the universe. That is who we're worshiping this morning. So I just want to invite you, if you want to come forward and fill the space. If you want to move out of what's comfortable, sometimes lifting a hand is enough, isn't it? Sometimes that can be uncomfortable enough. But we just want to press in and lean in because as we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So let's set our eyes on him this morning and let's just give him everything that we have, right church? Everything that we have. Let the worship rise up. Let our spirits rise up and our flesh quieten down as we worship the King of Kings together. Amen. Right or wrong thing 
shout with joy or burst into tears. You're so welcome to do it because there's one thing that we want to do. We want to worship our King. And so that's where we're directing our gaze. We're directing our gaze towards heaven, towards Jesus, towards our King, our Savior. And as we lift our eyes towards Him, He's looking down on us with such love. With such love.
Jesus at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you Jesus, Jesus Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. is the center of my life, of this church. Let's sing.
just such a precious moment like I look at us as a family and the fact that we get to celebrate Jesus together publicly and I think of the places around the world that can't do that and we yeah we are just so privileged we are so blessed and I think it just makes me sing that little bit more and dance that little bit more so yeah it's just wonderful to be with you and thank you that you yeah, that you come and that we can worship together corporately, it really means a lot. I think sometimes it's easy just to be at home and think, oh, I can just celebrate God on my own, but we need each other, don't we? So this morning, it is my absolute pleasure and privilege to be here on graduation morning. Um, and for those of you that don't yet know me, my name is Esther. I am the children's and families pastor here, and I am ready to champion our children today. <laughs> so to start with, the children did this really well last time that I was on the stage. And I think I'm going to see if the rest of the family can actually do this well as well. So I'm going to say a number, and you're going to repeat it. Okay, so I'm going to say number. Just before I do, I've got three G's, okay? So number one, I'm gonna say, number one, you say gratitude. Number one. Gratitude. Number one. Gratitude. This is an opportunity for us to be grateful for our amazing children's ministry team. So if you're in the children's ministry team, anyone that serves on Life Kids team, can you stand up, please? We 
We are so grateful for you. Stay standing. We are so grateful for you. We are grateful for the time that you take to serve our children and to input into their lives and the value that you hold on our children. So thank you so much. And actually, if you look at these, this team, it might look like quite a number, but we have 90 children in our registers and we have four kids teams. So we have firecrackers, sparklers, mini rockets and big rockets. And within each age group, we need three teams. So that is 12 teams that work here every Sunday, helping to feed into the lives of our children and sow seeds. And so look at them. Actually, we aren't enough. At the moment, we're running on bare minimum, and we would love it if you feel that this could be for you. Come and join our team, because we really need all the help to feed into these amazing children. Thank you. OK. Thank you, team. Number two, I say, what's my G word? Generations. I say number two, you say generations, are you ready? Number two. Generations. Number two. Generations. This is an opportunity for us as a church, not only to celebrate the youngest generation, but also the older generations, because I sent out a message from the church to say we would love it if we can connect the generations, because it's so important, isn't it? Our young children have such amazing faith, you guys. You are full of life, energy, you've got it. And we need that as older generations. And I reached out to the oldest generation in the church, the older ones, the plus 60s, and they have come back with such an amazing response because you have the wisdom and the experience that these children can draw on. And actually the middle generation of the kind of parent generation, we need you too because you're the ones that step into the gap and give us like an understanding of what's going on because we, we don't know what we're doing sometimes. So um, I reached out to these generations, the older generation, and decided that it would be a great idea to have this, the older generation bring a gift to celebrate our youngest generations that are graduating today. So if you are in that category and you know who you are because you'll be holding a book right now, can you make your way to the front? So anyone with a purple band, come this side, and then the next color is pale blue, and then we've got the turquoise greens and the peaches. Well done. And we are so grateful for you guys, because these coming to the front have all um, responded to the opportunity of blessing a younger person in our church with a Bible. And it has a prayer inside, and it says that it's sponsored from these, their names, um, and they've paid their money to sponsor the book. And it's a way of connecting an older, chatty adult to a child so that they can pray for one another. Well done. Okay, thank you. If you didn't get the email and you're thinking, oh, I wish it was me out the front, don't worry, next year there'll be graduation Sunday again. That'll be your chance, okay. Um, okay, and finally, my third G. This is what we're here for this morning. The third G is graduation. I say number three, you say graduation. Number three, graduation. Number three. Amazing. That means it is time for me to call out some children to come and receive their certificates. So you need to listen very carefully for your name. And if I call your name from your group, can you come and line up in order as best as you can, starting this side? Sorry that I'm walking away from the center. So I'm starting with the oldest group. This is the Big Rockets, and they are age 11. They'll be moving up to secondary school in September, and they will be moving into youth in September. So the first person I'd like to call up is Cassie Tajanira. <laughs> Aika, Aika Everest Matumi. Noah Brooks. Grace Gardner, and Josiah Giles. So if you come along here. And then if you just line up this way, try and find the adult that goes with you, but stand in front of them for now. Well done.
Okay, on to the next group while they sort themselves. So the next group moving up are the mini rockets. So mini rockets will be moving into big rockets. So if you're a mini rocket, listen for your name and it might be you. So we're starting with Jack Bounds, <laughs> Isaac Wakeley, <laughs> Titus Evans, Elizabeth Rafai, Talula Singani, Lucas Eccleston, Flossie Ballard. Thank you. And, and Unshara Donka, Bella Burgess, Amelia Snook, Zach Bester. a little bit of organisation to match them up with the adult because they don't all know each other yet. Well done kids, doing a good job. Okay, moving on to our next group while they sort themselves. This is Sparklers you've just finished year R, so reception, and you're moving into year one, this could be you. So, Sophia Walker, <laughs> Teela Sangani, Freddie Bounds, Eliana Bamadeli, Eliora Sika, Phoebe Schoenfeldt. Should we come along a bit here? Bethia Schoenfeld, Erin Solebo, Estelle Bonnet, and Tula Chancellor. to our smallest children. So this is the firecracker group. They actually move up slightly differently because when they turn three, they then move up the term after. But because they've been doing it all year long, we're just going to get all of them out. So some of them have been in sparklers a little while, but we're going to get all of the firecrackers that are graduating now up. So this is Olive Clark. <laughs> Eden Kinnear. <laughs> Lucas Fang. Anna Rouse, Gabriel Chancellor, Arthur Doughty, Noah Higgins, Evelyn Kist, Alana Kist, Madison Olsop, Solomon Doring, Elliot Walker. Okay, have a look at this amazing bunch of lovely children and adults. Show off your certificates for us. Well done. You have made it through to the end of your age group and you're ready for your next journey. Give them a huge round of applause. Well done. And just as we, before we send you out, if you can turn and meet your um, sponsor adult, and if the families of these children would like to come up and meet their sponsor adults as well, you've got a couple of minutes just to pray together, and I'll just pray for you as well before we go off into our groups. If there's anybody that's not got an adult with them, raise your hand. I know some adults are away, some children are away, so we're just trying to juggle and match them up. So everybody managed. Isn't it 
lovely. It's just so nice to see them connecting. I love it. It's so special just to get the generations together. And so I'm just going to pray now while they're having a chat and about to pray for one another. Um, but we'll just pray before we send them off. So Father God, we thank you that you're a God of generations, that you um, value every single age group. And we thank you that we can gather together in this family and be of all ages and be able to celebrate one another. And today we are so grateful that we get to celebrate these amazing children that you have given us and gifted us. And we just pray blessings on their lives that as they um, come to church and join with others that they will have seeds planted so deeply that really flourish in later years. We just thank you for their connections and their friendships and we bless them and bless all that they put their hands to. Amen. Okay, on that note, it is time to release the children. It's a little bit muddily, but um, hopefully the children's team, that some of them are up here, but they'll make it to their room soon. So if you like to make your way to your groups, and you can carry on up there. This is unsanctioned, but if you care about the future of this church, then these young people are your future church leaders, worship leaders, prayer ministry team. Pray for them. Join the children's team. It's the best team in the church. Get involved. Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. They're not just the future, they're the now, by the way. Right now, they're doing it. They pray for one another. They've got such faith. Like, it's amazing to see in their groups. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just going to try and pull myself together. <laughs> I don't know about you, but just seeing the older generation stand behind the younger generation is just a picture, I think, of God's heart to just cheer each other on. So while the children are leaving, Let's go and just go and find somebody, have a little chat, maybe someone you don't know, just for a couple of minutes, and then I'll call us back together. So, off you go, go and find someone.
Okay. Shall we gather back together? If you can find your seats, that would be great. Thank you. So, again, a really warm welcome. Um, if I didn't catch you at the beginning, my name is Michelle Kay, and it's just great to, to be here this morning together, worshiping God. And um, yeah, I'm a bit undone by what Esther just did this morning. I think that was just super special. So, we are now going to get ready for the tithes and offerings. So if the stewards could get ready, that'd be great. It says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. And I know some of us do this online or kind of monthly, but I think it's always good, isn't it, to go, yeah, you know what, God just says, settle in my heart what it is I'm to give today. And so if you could pass the buckets around, please. Thank you. There's also ways of giving. There it is. Behind me, if you're a bit techy, you could do the one on the left. I've never actually texted money to anyone, but... You're probably a dab hand compared to me. Yeah, so Father, whatever we give today, and, and I'd also like to say, if this is not your home church, have we got any visitors? Anyone with us for the first time? Is that my son putting his hand up? <laughs> Cheeky. Uh, but if you are, you're really, really welcome. Um, we, yeah. Tithe, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get myself together watching him, but he's hand up. Do tithe to your, to your own church. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, so we have got some video announcements. First announcement that's not on there is youth. You have got the great pleasure of staying in today and hearing Tim. Yes, that is something to get excited about. Um, but if we could have the visit video notices, Phil, that'd be great. Thanks. What are the notices? I thought you'd never ask. Well, there you go. Hey, Life Church Bath. I hope you're well and having a good morning. My name is Sam, and this is the Life Church News this week. This evening, we have our last well meeting before the summer holidays, led by Tim and the team at St. Swithin's Church. It'll run from the longer time of 6.30 to 10.30, and it'll be a beautiful time of worship and encounter with Jesus. We hope to see as many of you there as possible. Tomorrow, we have our monthly fast. This is where, as a church, we gather and we pray for our city and for our church family. If you haven't been involved yet and you'd like to be involved, there's more information on our website and on the eShot, and some more information will follow about what specifically we're praying for very soon. This Wednesday at 11 a.m. in the Forum Coffee House, we have our encore meeting led by Robin and Sue Henderson. There'll be a time of worship, there'll be a time of teaching, and there'll be a fellowship lunch afterwards. We'll have some luncheon with Robin and Sue Henderson. We hope to see you there. Good morning, church. I wonder if you could help us this summer. Um, I help lead World Sport Ministries that looks to reach people and bridge them into the kingdom of God through sport. One of the ways we do that locally is through our children's sports camps during the school holidays, which are great fun and a real blast to serve on. The fields are ripe with lots of children coming, but the workers are few. And so I'm asking if anybody could potentially volunteer some time to help make a difference. We have three camps, four days long, um, from the 29th of July to the 1st of August. The week after is the 6th to the 9th of August, and the week after that is the 12th to the 15th of August. So if anybody could give any days, it would be a real blessing and make a difference in young people's lives. You don't have to be a coach or even massively sporty. You just have a heart to serve and you love young people and um, you could help with small group leadership because we minister to young people as well as giving them a great time. So contact me at info at 
www.sportsmanagementmasters.org if you're interested and we'll see if we can get you involved. We're also looking for coaches from September who could go into schools. So if you think that could be you or you could learn to do that, also let me know. Or indeed, if you just love sport and love Jesus and think you could get involved in that type of ministry, there's loads going on. I'd love to hear from you. God bless you guys and hope to hear from you soon. That's all the news we have for this week. I've been Sam Winfield. Take care. Goodbye. Great. The only thing I need to add, and I've remembered this, see, you'd be very proud of me, is that Encore, it's the last one, isn't it? So it's the last Encore until September. So they're breaking for the summer for four weeks. Fourth of September. There we go. Fourth of September. So come along to the last one on Wednesday. Great. So I'd like to invite Jonathan Clark up because he's going to share a bit about his adventures over the last week. Hello, church family. How you all doing? Good. Um, I'm back. For those of you that don't know, Jonathan Horsfall and I uh, headed to Ukraine last week. Uh, takes two days to get there now because you can't fly straight into uh, Ukraine with it being at war and all that. Uh, so we flew into Poland uh, and got a rather long bus um, into Ukraine. Uh, how about 10 hours at a border, huh? Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Um, but we, um, we made it uh, uh, to a youth camp um, in the Carpathian Mountains. And I think we've got a picture, Ruth, if we can pop that up of the, the camp. So this is a bunch of youth um, from churches all across Ukraine. Um, they all came, and as we um, gathered, the reason that Jonathan and I went was because um, the young male leaders in the churches uh, were not really able to travel very easily. They, they could travel, but the thing was is that they can get uh, grabbed and conscripted at any point. So it becomes really difficult for them to move freely around the country. Uh, so we were asked to come, and really our mandate, we felt, was just to go and be people of peace. Um, so we went, and uh, it was a real privilege just to be among this beautiful group. Uh, they came from all, all over Ukraine. Uh, what was shocking is that all of them were experiencing um, direct effects of the war. And uh, it's an enormous country. Not all of it is, um, you know, the front line. There is a front line, but they are all experiencing uh, shelling and uh, rocket attacks and drone attacks and stuff. Uh, they live with um, alerts on their phone going off uh, weekly of uh, telling them they have to get to shelter. And so when we met with them, we said to the leaders, what, what do you need and what do these kids need? And they just said, we need rest. We need to be here, gather together. Um, it was the first time they managed to gather since before COVID because obviously they had covid and then straight afterwards, the country uh, was at war. So they've not been able to gather. This was the first time. Uh, and I just want to encourage you, church, that uh, there is one thing that we need as the people of God, and that is to be in his presence. And it was remarkable. We felt very um, humbled uh, to go and minister to these young people. And there was a large sense in which we went and said, what do we have to give? Because, you know, you're going through so much. Um, what do we have to offer? But God was really clear. It's time to um, just gather in his presence. And uh, night after night, uh, we would uh, share a bit. We would worship together. And then we would say, uh, who wants to pray? Stay and pray. And the youth would not run off. They would just stay. And they would be in the presence of God. Uh, and they would stay there for just extended times all just like really zoned in, um, meeting with the Father. Um, we got to uh, share um, and encourage people one-on-one -on -one and lots of beautiful ministry times with youth and the leaders, uh, mostly with translators. But even when we didn't have translators, you put an arm around someone and you say, come Holy Spirit, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit comes, and it's really beautiful. So a very humbling trip. Uh, but the takeaway that... Well, lots of takeaways, but the one I think I want to share with us is, um, church, it's humbling to go to a place where people are under such um, discomfort. And I'm aware that we have a huge blessing uh, of being in a place of peace and comfort and prosperity, right? Uh, even those among us that are struggling uh, are not at war. 
And it's, uh, it's really humbling. It's really humbling. And, um, but comfort is interesting because for your spiritual health, comfort isn't always, and actually I would say comfort isn't ever really a good thing for your spiritual health. It leaves you feeling like, actually, I can, I can self-sustain. It gives you the illusion of being able to self-sustain. And being among people who are so out of comfort, you really realize that they are just pressing into God because he is the safe place. He is the rock. Um, he is their savior. Um, and so I just wanted just to pray for us um, to be disquieted again, to be stirred again. So is that okay? If you'd like that, then you can stick your hands out by hands and heart. If you wouldn't like that, then just, you know, just say, Lord, would you um, pass by me <laughs> if you're not ready for it. Um, but fa Father, um, this morning, we just want to, um, we want to bless the nation of Ukraine. Lord, would you bless these kids that are up on the screen and their, their youth leaders. Father, would you continue to pour out your spirit on the church. Thank you that the church in Ukraine is the dwelling place of the Lord. Uh, that as they meet and gather and worship and fellowship, that there your peace is made manifest. And Father, um, we ask for ourselves uh, that even as we live in a place of such safety and security, we thank you for that blessing. But Lord, we ask for ourselves that you would disquiet us and unsettle us from any place where we've grown comfortable and self-dependent. Because Lord, we want to lean into you and lean on you. Um, trusting in you and being led by you daily. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Church, so good to be back with you. Um, the people of Ukraine send their love to you. Uh, and I think um, it will be, I know there's been links with Ukraine with this church uh, in the past. Uh, and I know some families have hosted Ukrainian families uh, since the war. But it was interesting having the connection. I think there's more to come um, in that journey. So thank you all. The privilege is mine to welcome, to speak to us this morning, Tim Rudge. Can we stretch our hands to Tim? Father, thank you for this amazing man. Thank you for this brother who is just uh, so sensitive to your leading. We ask this morning that you would fill him, that you would speak through him. Amen. You doing all right this morning? Doing good? Yes. Wow, it's been a good morning, hasn't it? Really, really, really thankful to be able to share with you this morning. For those of you who maybe haven't been with us that much of late, just to let you know, we've been on a series called Tent Table Temple, and we are currently exploring the table part to that series. We believe that these are three essential spaces that every follower of Jesus should learn to occupy. And it's been amazing to dig into the table, so we're going to do more of that this morning. But first, the first thing I want to do is I want you just to lean over to your neighbor, and I want you to ask them this question. If you could have a dinner party and invite two people, dead or alive, who would they be? Go. Don't overthink it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Phil. Phil, who'd you say? Amanda Cook. And who else? And Jesus. That'd be a good meal. Beautiful. All right. On, uh, on Christmas Eve in 1944, a 12-year-old German boy called Fritz heard a knock at his door. And for nine days, Fritz had heard gunshots and planes flying over and bombs crashing around his little cottage. 
Fritz was staying with his mother on the border of Germany and Belgium. And nine days, nine days previous, the Battle of Bulge had begun, which was the greatest attack in the Second World War that the Germans brought. And when this knock at the door came, Fritz's mother burst to the door and opened the door only to find three Americans standing at the door. And Fritz's mother invited the Americans in even though they had no common language. And one of the Americans had a gunshot wound that meant that he was very injured. So these three Americans came into the home and Fritz's mother began to cook them a meal. She got out her potatoes and then she took this rooster that Fritz writes was saved for his father's reunion and she began to cook a meal. And Fritz writes in his letter where this story comes from that this man that was injured was led on his bed and looked as white as snow. And right when Fritz's mother was halfway through this meal, there was a second knock at the door. And 12-year-old Fritz, without even thinking, runs to the door and opens it because he thinks there's more Americans. But instead of three Americans at the door, there's four guys wearing uniforms, German uniforms. And Fritz, though he's 12 years old, he knows exactly what the laws are. He knows that to host enemy in their home is treason and that him and his mother could be murdered. And Fritz is terrified. And then his mother steps forward, and I'm going to read you this part. And his mother speaks with this German officer. And the corporal leading the German patrol told Fritz's mother, we have lost our regiment and would like to wait till daylight. Can we rest here? And Fritz's mother said, of course. And she replied, you can also have a fine warm meal and you can eat till the pot is empty. But we want you to know that we have three other guests here whom you may not consider friends. But this is Christmas Eve, and there will be no shooting here. The corporal demanded, who is inside? And Fritz's mother replied, listen, you could be my sons, and so could they in there, but there's a boy with a gunshot wound, and he's fighting for his life. And his two friends are lost like you, and are just as hungry and as exhausted as you are. And this one night, this Christmas night, let us forget about killing. So the Germans took their guns and stacked them against the door. And Fritz's mother, with a quick conversation in French, convinced the Americans to do the same. And then, strangely, the entire group mixed and sat down tensely at the table. And suddenly, a bottle of wine and a piece of rye bed appeared from one of the German soldiers' bags. And Fritz's mother comments that she began to break the bread up into little pieces. And then Fritz's mother stood and said, Grace. And Fritz said he noticed that there were tears in her eyes as she said the old, familiar words. Come, hi, Jesus. Be our guest. And as Fritz looked around the table, he said he saw tears too in the eyes of the battle-weary soldiers. Boys again, some from America, some from Germany, but all far from home. And just before midnight, his mother went to the doorstep and they all joined her and stood, apart from Harry, who was still asleep in the bed. And they stared up at the stars for a moment and stood in silence. And looking at the brightest star in the heavens, Fritz said, for almost a moment, the war was a very distant an almost forgotten thing. This is a beautiful story, a true story from the Second World War. And I want to share with you this morning about the Great Banquet. This is a message that I've entitled The Great Banquet, and we're going to look at a story in Luke 14. And we're going to read about the call to every follower of Jesus to feast at God's table, but also to become hosts that invite people to this great banquet. So if you can turn in your Bibles to, to Luke 14, we're going to head there and we're going to begin to work our way through this passage. 
kind of methodically with some context. I really believe that Jesus did his best work at the table. Love the story of Zacharias, this deceptive, lying tax collector who comes down from his tree. And Jesus says, I'm eating at your home. And then Zacharias' heart begins to change. Love the story of Zacchaeus. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I love the story of Mary and Martha. And in this gospel in Luke, there's more meal times recorded than any other gospel. I love the NT writes. He says, most of the gospel writers kind of paint this picture about the Christian life, that it's like a journey. He said, well, Luke, Luke makes it seem like a party. I love that. You might be familiar with the story in Luke 15, just a chapter after this, where we have the story of the prodigal son, and we know that the climax of the prodigal son's story is a great banquet, right? You might be familiar with the, the story of the good supper. I hope you are, this meal that Jesus shares with his friends before he goes to the cross. You might also be aware of the story just after that, the story of Emmaus Road. This is a cool story, Emmaus Road. There's these guys walking along the road away from Jerusalem, disappointed, frustrated, down heart. And Jesus rocks up and starts to chat to them. And they begin to discuss all their fears and their disappointments with Jesus. And it says that Jesus begins to open the scriptures and show them where he was from the beginning right up to the end. And then Jesus is walking along with them and they get to their house and Jesus kind of makes it seem like he's not going to, he's going to carry on and doesn't want to presume an invite, but they, they invite him into their home. And then, sat at the table, Jesus breaks the bread and it says that their eyes were opened and they saw that this wasn't just a man, that this really was Jesus that he really had rose from the dead, that he really was alive. So they run back to Jerusalem, and they tell the disciples, listen, it's true, Jesus really did rise again. He's alive. We saw him. We were walking along the road, and our hearts began to burn. And then over a meal at the table, our eyes were opened, and we saw again that he is Jesus, that he's alive. And just as they're having this conversation, this is just so funny, Jesus appears again. He's there again in the middle of the room, and he begins to quiet their fears. He shows them the scars on his hands and begins to tell them, it really is me. I'm here. I did it. I rose from the dead. And then when they're all at peace, he turns to them again and says, what's for dinner? And they say, well, we got some fish. And Jesus eats again. He eats second dinner. I love that. Jesus can often be found at the mill table. I spoke to Edmund this week. I don't think he's here, but many of you will know Edmund. And I, I love that I can say this, because if you have a problem with it, you can talk to Edmund. Edmund said, Tim, you have to understand that in the Jewish faith, everything of great significance happens in the context of family at the table. Jesus had a long history and understanding that the table was of great significance. So this is the context of this whole passage we're going to get into in Luke 14. Jesus is at the table. And I was doing a little bit of a kind of interesting study. And many of you will have this different kind of traditions yourself for what you do when people come to your home. But I want to tell you, for example, that in Turkey or in Japan or in India, and definitely at my parents' house, if you go for a meal and you leave food on the, on, the t on the plate, what you're kind of communicating is that the meal wasn't that great, right? So it, it's good, it's polite to finish your plate, okay? That's good to know. But if you're in China, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're in China, apparently, if you leave your plate finished, if it's clean, what you're actually saying is, 
you didn't quite have enough. The portions weren't big enough. So the best thing to do in China is to leave a little bit of food so that people know that you, that, that you had your fill, right? Any, any coffee snobs in the house? Yeah, a few coffee snobs. Okay, well, if you're a, an Ethiopian's house, I hear that the coffee process is about two hours. They're not just going to make you a coffee. They are going to roast the beans in front of you. Yeah, you heard right. They're going to roast the beans in front of you. They're going to brew the coffee, and then they're going to serve it to you. Usually takes a couple of hours. So I would book the day out for that meal. Okay, that's an Ethiopian family. Well, how about, you know, etiquette in terms of showing up on time? Right? If you invite someone to your house at 7 p.m. in Germany, you better bet they're going to be there at, at 7 p.m., right? Latin America, maybe our custom a little bit. It's kind of polite to get there a little bit late, right? Ten minutes late, don't want to put pressure on the host, turn up a little bit late. While in Africa, <laughs> in Africa, if you're invited over at 1 p.m., don't even bother showing up at 1. 1 doesn't mean 1. Show up at 2, 3, Show, show up any time in the afternoon. The afternoon is good, all right? Okay? So we have these different customs, the different rules. And what I want you un to understand is that in the Middle Eastern culture, when you are invited over for dinner, it's a very serious thing. It's not flippant. It's almost as if you're being invited to a wedding. This is a serious invite. And to turn down an invite to a meal is very offensive. So when you are invited over to someone's house in the Middle Eastern culture, you have to take it very seriously, almost as if you are RSVPing to a, a, a wedding, right? And we know that uh, in, in the Middle Eastern culture, in Jesus' culture, when you go into a Middle Eastern home, you are to take your shoes off, your sandals off, and they'll be provided this bowl of water which you can either wash your own feet or if the guest is really kind, they'll, sorry, the host is really kind, they'll get down and actually wash the feet of their guests, which we know Jesus did. So Jesus, verse 1, is at the home on Sabbath of a Jewish, a prominent Jewish Pharisee. And I, I, I love this, that it says that, you know, it, it says that he was being watched. Well, apparently this is not just kind of, oh, they were, they were looking over at him, but this is kind of even a sinister espionage. They're, they're trying to catch him out. They've invited him, but they've got a little bit of inter interior uh, motives, right? And then verse 2 says, there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling. You can see it in verse 2. I find this really interesting. When me and Maria were planning our wedding, one of my favorite parts was the table plan. Because I'm a bit cheeky and you can kind of think, I, I, just, I just wonder what conversations that uncle will have with that mate. Like, I'll put those people together. And it's almost as if that's what the Jews have done to Jesus. They're like, we'll put the really sick dude next to Jesus, and we'll see how that goes down, right? And they're just watching. And then we have verse 3. Jesus, he knows what's going on. He asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him, and he sent him on his way. And then he asked them, verse 5, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into the well on the Sabbath, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. See, Jesus knew the law pretty well as well. And he knew that in that area, there was many open wells that people and often oxes and animals would fall into. And it was well within the Jewish law to actually pull an ox out of a well or a child or a human that fell in. So Jesus is making quite a stark point and judging these, the, the hypocrisy of these Jews. 
saying, if I can pull an ox out of a hole, why can't I heal a man, right? And then we head on to verse 7. And when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited them, host by invited both of you, will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be, will be exalted. So Jesus begins to go after the guests, right? And yes, he is challenging their, their physical way in which they approach these uh, banquet meals. It's as if you got invited to a wedding and you walked in when you got into that main meal and you just confidently just rocked up and sat next to the groom, right? The top table. Jesus is saying, don't do that. I heard that there's actually often in meals there was kind of these clusters of uh, seats and there would be an elevated seat amongst the group of seats. And Jesus is saying, don't immediately go to the seat that is most important. But I think also he's saying something a little bit deeper, which is when you're in the company of other people, position yourself in a lowly way. Get curious about the other people. Don't bring yourself in a way that you think you're the most important and everyone should know about you, right? Jesus says if you're a guest, then take the lowest seat and maybe you'll be exalted. And then Jesus isn't done because after going after the guests, he turns to the host. Imagine this. Jesus turns to the host and he begins to challenge the host. He says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or your sisters or your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back. Oh, no. And so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Because although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And Jesus, this is quite an important passage because it really sets up where we're going to go. And it sets up verse 15, which has a lot of significance in this whole passage. Verse 15 says this, when one of those at the table with him heard this, i.e. all that he's just shared, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. This is an interesting statement and one that it's important to unpick because really this verse sets up this entire passage of scripture. Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. What is this Jew talking about? Well, it was believed in the Jewish community that one day the sign of the end of the times when the kingdom truly did come, there would be a great banquet and the Messiah would be present. We read about this banquet also in Revelation, right? It talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? But something had happened along the way with the Jews. See, it was Isaiah that first prophesied this, and I'm going to read it to you. Isaiah 25 verse 6 says this, On this mountain... The Lord Almighty will prepare a rich feast of food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud which enfolds all people and the sheet which covers all nations. And he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and he will remove this people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. This is a great end time promise from Isaiah, right? This was 700 years prior to when Jesus came. But 100 years after, 600 years before Jesus came, something happened to this passage. 
when the Jews returned from exile, there appeared this new translation of this scripture, which had the same kind of essence. There would be a banquet, and death would be swallowed up, and pain would be no more, and that every tear would be washed away, but only Jews were invited. And even in this book of Enoch, which was a, which was a text that was uh, uh, around the time of uh, this time, in Enoch, it, it translates this scripture to say, there will be Gentiles there, but the Gentiles will actually be killed by the angel of death, and all the Jews will watch. Interesting, right? So the Jews had this belief that there would be a great banquet, but only the important Jews would be invited, Okay. So this is what sets up this parable that we're going to go into. Because Jesus has a different idea. He has a different view of what this great banquet will look like. And we enter into verse 16. Jesus replied, a man was preparing a great banquet. And he invited many guests. And at that time, the banquet he sent, at that time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come. Everything is now ready. It's like you have people over to your house and they're in the living room and you bust in and say, the food is ready. But in this Middle Eastern culture, it would have been more, they bust into the village and they shout, everybody, food is ready. And they come from their homes and they come, right? But verse 8 says, they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five, oxen, five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. So the servant came back and reported this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry, and he ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, and the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. And then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. This last verse, Jesus is going from talking to the singular to the collective. He's saying, I tell y'all, not one of you will be invited to the taste my banquet. Quite a stark challenge. Okay, so let's get into this passage. There's three groups invited here, right? Jesus first extends an invite to the Jews. And they all have excuses, which if you unpick these excuses, they were not legitimate. They were bad excuses, It's like I get invited to a wedding, I RSVP, I pick my meal choice, and then the day before I text the bride and I say, I would have loved to have been there, but I've got to wash my car. I've got to wash my car. I would have loved to have been there, but something's come up. This is the excuse they've made. I haven't got time to unpick them, but interestingly, they're all baseless, the excuses. And remember... This is very disrespectful. This is very dishonoring to say to a host with such a bad excuse, I've just married so I can't be bothered to come to your your feast. Right? So Jesus says, okay, well now I'm going to invite those that are still within our country, our community, but those that have been on the edge, those that feel beaten up, those that are lame, those that are in pain, I'm going to invite those to come. So he invites them and they fill the table but there's still some room. So then he goes beyond the country lines. He goes beyond his own community and he goes to other communities and he says, you can come too. This is important because this is Jesus saying, listen, this isn't just for Jews. This is for all people. And I'm going to go to other communities and I'm going to compel them to come in. This is significant because me and you, most of us, I would have thought are one of those people. 
that were out of, in the country lanes and that Jesus brought into the banquet table. It's interesting if you look at that very last passage. It says, then the master told the servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in. And that one little passage used out of context was the reason that many people went to other countries, Augustine and many others, and persecuted and manipulated people to come into their camp, right? They used this verse going out into other communities and said, now you have to be a part of our thing, right? This is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying you should go out to your atheist friends and strong arm them to come to your small group. What he is saying is people outside of the context of your community and your tradition, they're going to need convincing they really are welcome at your table. That's what he's saying. He's saying convince them, compel them, help them to know that they truly are welcome at your table. This is important because honestly, this scripture was used completely out of context to persecute and to be so unkind to so many people. But Jesus is saying really, extend your arms so wide that those outside of the camp know they are welcome at the table. Okay. Are you doing okay? Is this making sense? Very quiet, you're listening. Must be good. So, we're coming to a close here, but I'm just gonna kind of high uh, recap four important points and give you a few thoughts to uh, take away this morning. Number one, banquets are at the heart of the Christian faith. One day, we will be invited to this heavenly banquet that Jesus talks about, that Isaiah shares in Isaiah 25. One day we will be invited to a great banquet, but still today we get to partake in a great feast. And we should enjoy God together. We should enjoy God together. I love what Esther said earlier. We have a lot to enjoy about God. He is really good. And you have permission to enjoy God. You have permission to relish and celebrate and delight in being in relationship with God. You're allowed to smile and be happy about being in relationship with God. Number two, communion is where we get a foretaste of the great banquet ahead. I love that story that I shared at the start. Those soldiers that stood on the door with Fritz's mother and they stared into the stars and for a moment then the war seemed far away. The pain and the presentness of all that, that was happening in that country. That's what communion does. It's the starter. It gives us a taste of that which is to come. Of one day when all shall be well. When, when every tear will be wiped away. In communion, we get to lean in to that great narrative that is to come. The banquet that we will all be led to. Isn't that beautiful? Number three, the table is where love finds legs. I know, yeah, it's, it's meant to be funny. The table is where you can communicate clearly though you feel unseen, though you might feel overlooked, though you think you may be on the edge, you welcome here. You belong here. You belong at this table. You can eat from the same pot, whatever you believe. Number four, we have to learn to host with pure motives. Jesus is saying this. He's challenging us. Don't host people to feed your own egos. Don't host people to kind of air your own good ideas. Don't invite people into your home to impress them with all your expensive wine. But invite people into your home to treat them like the guests of honor that they are. 
Give them a taste of heaven, of a crazy love that finds us when we feel most apart from God. This doesn't mean that you have to go to Tesco's and then buy a bottle of wine that you can't afford. But it does mean that you have to give of yourself in a way that is costly to another. Give it of yourself to another in a way that puts someone else before yourself. Compel people to come into your home. So how do we, what do we do? I think it's clear that we are both those that were found in the hedges and the lanes and countries that were apart from God. But by his grace, we have truly been invited to the table. We've been invited to the table. And you don't get to just have one meal. You can keep coming back. You can keep returning to God's table and enjoying him. And my first kind of, my first uh, charge for you is enjoy God. Sit at his table, take communion and feast on him. John talks about, in John 6, Jesus says, come to me and feed. This is kind of strange, right? This is mysterious, but within communion, we actually get to come to Christ and to receive from his life. Feast on Jesus. Come to the table. But I think also at the heart of this story is really the guests at God's table should really become hosts of, of their own banquets. That we should become so delighted in enjoying the goodness of God that we host our own tables and we say, come on in and feast yourself. Come on in and enjoy this good news. Come on in and enjoy. So we must extend the invite. Yes, to our friends. Invite your friends into your home. But also invite those that are on the edge. Invite the lukewarm Christians in your life. Invite those that are doubting their faith. Invite atheists into your home. Invite people that are, you know, dabbling in different faiths. Invite those that have strange political views and, yeah, invite them into your home as well. You know, hospitality is the same word that comes from hospital and hostel. And what it means is to open your arms wide. Whoever you are, whatever battle you're facing in your mind, in your heart, in your body, you are welcome in this home. You belong. Come and taste and see that he really is good. And we're going to give you a foretaste because though we can enjoy all that he is here, one day we'll get to fully enjoy him even more in eternity. And put that ring, that sound of eternity in people's hearts as you gather. You know, I, I love studying leadership. I really believe that God has called us to lead, to be leaders, to raise up leaders. But I want to just, you probably know this already. Leadership isn't really something that's talked about much in the Bible. It gets mentioned three times. But what is mentioned a lot is Jesus' style of leadership, which usually can be summed up in these three words. Come, follow me. At the heart of discipleship is this. Come be in my company. Come and be in my company. Come and be around me. Come and get in my space. This is the heart of discipleship. This is true discipleship. Not here's my four leadership hacks, but come to my table. Come and see how we do it. Come and be in our company. Okay, this is Jesus' commission to all of us. Invite people to your table. Bring them into your space. Communicate through good food, yes, through drink, through nice smelling candles, through, through whatever you like, through music, but most of all, through your presentness. Communicate to people that they are welcome and that they belong. You're doing okay. I think I'm coming to the end here. I wanted to 
put a light challenge out to you because I know that this is tricky for some people. Some of you have flatmates that you're embarrassed about and you can't invite people to your home. Others you have other situations where it's not easy. But for most of us, we have a table. Maybe we don't have lots of chairs, but we can invite someone to our home. And I know, listen, a whole bunch of you are doing this. Probably most of you are doing this. And actually, this church, this community began around the table. It began in communities of people getting together and sharing food and sharing life, right? But I want to encourage you this week. Invite someone to your table that you don't know very well. If you want to invite someone that is outside this building, all the better. But maybe they're in this building. Maybe you've, there's someone in here you've never spoken to and it's a little bit awkward. But you look at them and say, I want you to come to my house this Sunday. Some of you will be doing this this lunchtime. We're having lunch with some people this lunch, right? And I want to say to you that we eat a lot, right? We eat every day, most days, maybe not Monday, most days. But it's a holy thing to share a meal with people. So I want to get better at this. Look people in the eyes and be present and remember that this meal we're sharing is a foretaste of all that is good and all that is true. And one day we're going to be invited to a great banquet that will signify the end of death as we know it. Isn't that beautiful that every day we get reminders that God is good, that we are loved, that we do belong? I think, Michelle, that's everything I've got to say to you. But I would love it uh, if I won't do Jonathan's get up and meet someone uh, but if you can, find someone before you leave and just say to them, hey, we'd love you to come over. Or maybe do a Jesus and say, I'm not hosting. I'm coming to your house for dinner and see how that goes. All right. Okay, I'm going to pray. Jesus, I thank you so much that we have been invited to a great feast. I thank you, God, that yes, there is much work. There's discipline. There's... There's all kinds of sacrifice and suffering that we have to go through in this life with you. But we have been invited to a great feast. We have been invited to a God that loves to celebrate. And God, we pray right now that you would teach us to not only feed upon you, but also to invite people to this great banquet table with arms open wide that says, no matter where you've been, what's on your breath, what you smell like, you belong here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Wow, I love that. Tim's just given us all permission to invite ourselves to everybody else's house. So I'll see you next week, Tim, about 1.30. Great. Um, so, yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. I feel... Yeah, I definitely feel challenged. And you are just such a rich well, my friends. And it is just, isn't it good to sit and actually feast on what you bring us? So thank you, Tim. Um, so we're just going to end. We'll have teas and coffees in a moment on this side. So if you want to, as Tim was saying, just go and mingle, have a chat with someone, invite someone around, or indeed invite yourself. Um, but on this side, if I could invite the prayer ministry team to come up. This band of freedom warriors love to pray. And if you are, you know, facing something that's difficult or just there's illness in your body, there is nothing too big or too small. And if you want one of your brothers and sisters in Christ to stand with you in prayer about absolutely anything, I know it is their great honor to do that. So I just want to invite you that if you would like prayer for anything, ev there might even be something that Tim was talking about this morning where you think, do you know what, I'd love to invite someone, but I just, I struggle with that. I struggle to have the confidence to do that. Or even if Jesus laid a table for you right now, you'd feel like, I totally believe in Jesus, but oh, I just don't know if I feel like I could sit with him right now because I've got this going on. I just want to invite you. We'd love to stand with you in prayer. So if you'd like prayer, shimmy on down that way. Um, if you'd like to your coffee over here, and otherwise have a blessed week. I just pray that the Holy Spirit will surprise you throughout your week.
that you will feel his presence close to you and all around you, that your homes will be filled with his peace and filled with his power and that the gospel of peace will go with you on your feet as you walk out of here and you will bring it to everybody just by being who you are in Christ. So I bless you with that in Jesus' name. See you next week.